So we're at the American Yacht Club. We're taking off soon and heading up for Maine. Uh, Robin and I have been living on the boat for about two months now, and we've got a real fun opportunity here in Newburyport, and that is that Ben Fundus, the video editor, lives here. Uh, he runs the movie theater called The Screening Room. If you're in Newburyport or within the area, uh, stop in, check it out. It's an awesome little one-room theater and uh, you're supporting an awesome family and an establishment in the community for a long time, so I expect to hear that some of you have been stopping in soon. But anyways, <laughs> we can have Ben come out and do the filming, uh, or at least help with some of it, which is nice, then he doesn't have to review it all. So he and I have been filming the last couple days about some stuff on the boat and showing you what's working and what's not after two months of living aboard. Because I'm not a sailor, I'm not experienced at this, and I took my best stab at what I thought would work from the just incredible amount of information there is to sift through and all of the incredible amounts of advice that I've been given over the years. So as we motor around Arabella here, you'll notice a few things. Probably the first thing you'll notice is that we are sitting a little low in the water. Um, that's kind of to be expected with the heavy construction and the fact that she's fully packed right now for cruising. So we've got water in the tanks and diesel in the tanks. We've got several weeks worth of food. We've got all of our personal possessions. So when we go to say cross the Atlantic, I don't really expect her to sit any more than an inch or two lower in the water than she is at the moment. Um, so performance wise, she might be a tiny bit slower. She might be a tiny bit more tender, but in reality, it shouldn't be much of an issue. Now another thing I'm sure you're noticing is the beautiful scum line along the water line. Uh, and that has been compliments of the Merrimack River over the last couple weeks. And I haven't cleaned it off for a couple reasons. One of those reasons is that there has been a lot of rain and a lot of beach closures and stuff due to sewage in the water that's being released up river. So I'm not real thrilled about getting in the water. The other thing is there's a ripping current here, which is another reason to not get into the water. But in the next month or so, I'm gonna have to haul Arabella out and we've gotta redo the paint job. And that's not because something was done wrong. It's just the nature of launching a new wooden boat. So if we look at the seam compound here, and see how it's sunken in a little bit, and this one's all cracked and bumpy. That's because the planks have been moving as they settle. Uh, so we wanna go through and clean up that seam compound, put a fresh coat of paint on it. But the below water line ones, or the ones near water line, are really the ones we wanna play with. Because if you look down here, the seam compound underneath the paint has actually made a raised rib. Uh, and if you were to feel down the hull, you can see here too, this one's all a raised rib, uh, which gives the marine growth a great place to latch onto. Uh, and it makes cleaning and scrubbing the bottom harder. And it means that the whole bottom of the boat is essentially ribbed. And that doesn't really help our speed through the water either. Uh, there's nothing to really avoid here. You want to pack the seams well with seam compound and it's flexible so that it does exactly this. Uh, and now that the planks have had a couple of months to swell, we can scrape that extra seam compound out and we can put on a fresh coat of paint and things should be stable for quite a while. And when we do that, we'll sand this white paint back a bit and we'll take and we'll raise our water line six inches or so, so that we're up a little bit above it. Uh, and that scum line is giving us a jolly dee gandy, really sweet water line. So when we pull it out of the water, there's gonna be absolutely no guesses as to where she sits. We can just take some painter's tape and we can run a line four or six inches above that scum line, sand the scum off and paint it. So, I'm really not psyched to get into this water, and I'm really psyched to have a really accurate water line. So for at the moment, the scum stays. So here's the bob stay that 
the wings and the tip of the anchor can get hung up on, but they're pretty easy to, to get unhung. And if we look here, we'll see my climbing influence put to work. So this is Dyneema or Spectra, whatever you want to call it. It's all sort of the same thing. Um, but this is a rock climbing sling and I've folded it over several times to make the junction between the shackle and the eye on the turnbuckle. And these slings are the same thing that holds the shrouds up, which ultimately hold the mast up. And they're also around the mast connecting the shrouds uh, and the running rigging to the mast. And that's definitely unorthodox. It's not something that you're gonna see very commonly. If we look at the dead eyes here, you can see that they are also slung with the same material. It's a different color because in climbing, they make all the different lengths a different color. So you can identify real quickly which sling you wanna use. Um, but they've worked really well for this application and so far for up in the rig. Uh, it's the same, like I said, it's the same material as this um, that we use for the dead eyes. It's just a, a different form of it, webbing instead of a rope. And it's insanely, incredibly strong. It's relatively UV resistant. And what I really like about it is that I've worked with this material for a very, very long time. I know what it looks and feels like when it's UV degraded. I know how much chafe on it is something to not worry about. I know what point it is to worry about. And they're relatively inexpensive and super quick and easy to replace. And enough spares to do the entire rig will fit in a bundle about yay big and weigh about a pound. So carrying spares is super easy. I can always just raid them off my rack for my climbing gear if I need to. Uh, and like I said, they're a material that I'm just really comfortable with and know really well, uh, which makes inspecting a breeze. I guess the last thing out here is Victoria, um, which so far I've been incredibly happy with. There's a few modifications we need to do. Um, I put the rope on the outer edge as a rub rail and I put it on with bronze ring shake nails and epoxy and I thought that that would certainly keep it in place and I was definitely wrong. Uh, there's enough of a lip here under the rope uh, that if it gets caught on top of or under a dock or whatever it's just way too much leverage uh, so I, I think it's going to not be super pretty but I think I'm basically going to get like dock protection guard and just put a big old fat rub rail on there um, that's super, super secure and is something that no matter what we do to the tender is, is going to stay put. Because um, I've maintained from the beginning that this thing's going to see a rough life and no matter how careful we are with it, it just sees a rough life. It's tied to the boat, the weather's banging it against the hull, we're shoving our way into dinghy docks, we're running up on the beaches. Uh, she just gets used but the stability has been phenomenal. We've been out in some, some breaking little white caps out here when the tide goes out and the wind's blowing in, you get all these little standing waves and all these tiny little white caps and Tender has no issues with it whatsoever. She's been super stable, handles really well. I have nothing but praise for the design that Bob ended up putting together, inspired off the Atkin plans. She's a She's a sweet little boat. And I've been really happy with the e-propulsion. So I was not intending to put a motor on it. I was intending to row. And then we were at the Mystic Boat Show and Alex, who's one of their sales reps, came up and said, I wanna hook you up with one at wholesale and get an e-propulsion motor on your tender. And Robin just kind of like George Costanza to everybody out of the way and was like, yes, 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 yes. Um, and I wasn't totally sold, but she was. So we got the motor and she was right. It's made a huge difference. Getting a Kiva to shore three or four times a day, running people back and forth, bucking the current here. Uh, it's, it's been handy. Rowing would have been really tough, uh, especially with the dog. So the, the motor's been, been fabulous. We sprung and picked up an extra battery 
which is definitely a luxury, but living aboard, it's been really nice because we can bring it to shore somewhere and plug it in overnight and still go out to the boat and then grab the extra battery and just keep swapping them back and forth, which has been real handy. And when we were in Bristol, one of our neighbors in the mooring field, their tender came untied and took off down the mooring field. And they asked if we could give them a lift to go pick it up. But the battery was at 50, 60%. And I knew we had enough to get down. I wasn't sure we had enough to get back. But since we had the extra battery, I just hollered to somebody on the boat. I think Scott at the time was on board. And I was like, hey, can you grab me that battery down below? We threw it in the tender. We ran all the way down the end of the bay. We got his tender and we were coming back against the waves and the wind. I got within 200 yards of Arabella and the battery ran out of juice. And I just grabbed the other one, threw it on and got back to it. Uh, so, so far I've been really happy with, with having the second battery. And the motor has been great. It's, it hums right along. We can sit here and do donuts. And the battery life has been, been pretty good. If we are conservative with the throttle, we can go back and forth to the Yacht Club uh, a dozen times or more before we need to charge it. I would say we're charging the battery like once a week or so, uh, which is better than I expected. So there's a lot to do down below, but really the bulk of the work is up on deck. So we've got a wire here that goes down to the tip of the bowsprit, and this is where the roller furler jib is gonna go. So the roller furler will allow us to roll the sail basically up around this wire and then unroll it. And if we didn't have that, if it was hanked on like the staysail is, which I'll show you in a minute, I would have to come out here to haul the sail down and lash it and get it situated. Um, and being out on the tip of the bowsprit with the anchors here bouncing around in some rough weather is not really a place that I want to be. Uh, so the roller furler will make that a lot easier. And we haven't got the roller furler on because it's a bit of a project. We have to take this stay down, but we had to have the stay up to get the right measurement. And then we've got to build the foils that go on it and set all that up, put the sail on it, bring the whole thing out here or bring the boat to the dock and put it up. So it's a, a solid day or two um, with a knowledgeable hand to get that accomplished. And honestly, the boat sails just fine so far under staysail. I'm sure she'll sail a lot better with the jib, um, but it just, just haven't got around to it yet. So right now the sail is sitting in Granby as is the roller furler. So next time we go back, we'll get those and that'll be one of the first things we do when we uh, come back to the boat after Granby. Been super happy with these Mantis anchors. Uh, we've used them a couple times, not enough to, to judge how well they hold or anything, although I've only heard good things about them but deploying them and retrieving them has worked out really well. They have the flukes here and we do have the bob stay. So when you pull the anchor up, you kind of have to wait until it spins a little bit and gets in the right orientation and then you can pull it up so it doesn't get hung up. And if it's really rocking and rolling and things are bouncing around, you just have to wait for the right minute to crank and pull it past the bob stay. And if it's really calm and the anchor's just sitting there, it's real easy to poke it with a boat hook. Um, but either way, that hasn't been a problem. You can see we have a line here, which is keeping the anchor from coming off of the rollers. And at some point, I need to come out and drill a hole right through the shaft of the anchor here, and we can put a solid pin in there and secure that a little bit better. But the line is plenty. Yeah. It can't go anywhere. No. This staysail pedestal came from Victoria. Uh, Akin had just a club footed, so the boom can whap all around and act like a club. And we were definitely going to anchor that onto a pedestal. So it was really serendipitous that Victoria came with this beautiful one. And that fit really well and is working nicely. Uh, we do need to send the staysail Back to Robbie Doyle. So these are the hanks, which is how you would traditionally put the jib on out on the wire. 
This wire is a bit fat for these. You can see how tight that fit is and they have a tendency to kind of get jammed on us. So somewhere there must have been some miscommunication with the wire size. And I'm not terribly surprised because all of the shrouds, then the jib wire are all three eighths and then this is seven sixteenths. So I'm assuming that they just looked and saw three eighths wire for everything and threw them on. Um, but it's been working. They just get a little sticky going up and down. And when you see us hoisting or raising sails, this is kind of fighting that a little bit, um, but it's, it's not a huge deal. So this gem came from Victoria. It's our manual windlass. And I was warned against putting this on the boat by many, 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 many people and about how much we would absolutely hate having to come up here and pull up the anchor. Uh, and so far, I do not agree with them for myself personally. Uh, we've had 150 feet of chain out and it really did not take all of that long to pull it in. The hatch is pretty perfectly placed that you can come up here, throw your feet on the foredeck, your butt on the hatch, and you can sit here and run the levers. So even when the boat's rocking and rolling and pitching, this feels really comfortable, really stable. Uh, and between sitting on the hatch and having your feet and having your hands on both the handles, the boat can really rock and roll and pitch all over the place and you can pretty comfortably just sit there and keep cranking on away. Our homemade mass bands and the belaying pins that we took from Victoria and elsewhere have been working really, really well. Been, been very happy with this setup. And we are actually shy three belaying pins. So if you have or know where we can get a few of these at a reasonable cost, uh, let us know. If you send us an email, I can let you know what the pin diameter is, or maybe Ben can throw that in there in the, on the screen. Um, but yeah, we're shy three, and they would be super handy. We've been hunting around for them, haven't found them yet. We can buy them new, um, but I know they exist somewhere used at a very reasonable rate. You'll notice that our mainsail here is not furled the prettiest, and we've got a continuous line run around it at the moment. We had some really big winds, uh, so I went through and lashed it down really well, because the last thing we want is this catching wind and sailing us around the mooring field. Uh, but one of the things, one of the many things that's left to do is install lazy jacks and sail covers. And I want to make those in each other. So essentially, from the boom, two pieces of fabric will come up a little ways and then there will be lines from those that go up to the mast. So when you're sailing, kind of like the topping lift at the end of the boom, you slack them off so that the sail isn't interfering with them. But when you go to lower the sail, you pull the sail in in line, and then you can tighten up the lazy jacks. And what they do is they create a net on either side. So when the sail comes down, it just kind of naturally folds itself in there. You don't have to work so hard. Uh, and then it would have cloth on the sides that end up being sail covers. And then you just run a zipper down the middle or some ties down the middle and close it up. Uh, Cause right now the UV is eaten away at these super nice sails that Robbie made. Uh, and they won't last terribly long if we don't get some sail covers on them and keep them protected when they're not actively being used. So lazy jacks are on the super short list and sail covers are quickly coming after that. So these blocks are something that's not currently working out terribly well. And the reason is, is this shoulder on this side, but more so this notch on this side. It does a great job of keeping this line where it needs to be on the spar, uh, but it also does a great job of catching on the topping lift and it's gonna catch on the lazy jacks. So if we look at the very aft end here, the boom, this is our topping lift. And what this does is it lifts the boom when we don't have the sail raised is when the sail is raised, it's the sail that's keeping the boom up. But right now, if we were to let off this topping lift, this boom would 
should sit all the way right down on top of our dodger here. And when we go to lower the sail, what's happening is it comes down a ways and then the gaff can bump into the topping lift and that notch that holds the line wedges itself in there and then the gaff won't come down and you gotta pull it up a little bit and get it to clear and continue down. Thankfully for these, it's a super, super easy fix. We just need to taper the ends in a little bit more so that this isn't quite a shoulder and it'll just pop off the line. And we'll do the same thing on this end and we'll move this lashing to a hole that's drilled right next to the spar in the middle of it. And with all that glue area, that's way, way, way more than strong enough to keep this line from slipping. And if this kind of smoothly comes in one end and smoothly out the other and the line goes through a hole in the middle, there won't be anything to get caught on the lazy jacks or the topping lift. Because right now you can see that lazy jack or that topping lift is just going to get caught right in that gaff and just going to stay put until we haul it back up a little higher. Okay. Cool. We've got two 200 watt panels, so if these are in full sun, 400 watts is the most we can get from the two of them, mounted on our very temporary Dodger here. And I've honestly been blown away at how much power these two panels generate. And talking with Satchel, he was saying that he was really surprised and that he's been on boats with bigger solar arrays, but that were pulling in less power from them. And I think everything being brand new certainly helps with that. Um, none of the wires are corroded. Everything's full size. They're brand new panels. I think a lot of it also has to do with the Victron chargers and the lithium iron batteries. So if we're creating 390 watts out of these two panels, all of that can go in the batteries, no problem whatsoever. And we have a big enough bank that if we have three or four or six days without much sun, we slowly drain the battery bank down. But when we have three or four days like this, we can take all of that energy and store it. And we don't really, we haven't got to a point where the batteries are fully charged and the solar panels don't have a place to put it. Uh, so that's been one of the really nice perks of having the, the really big battery bank. And we're gonna add a wind generator at some point, probably off the aft shrouds here. And I think with the wind and the solar, we might run into the problem of too much power. And that's a problem that I'm really excited to have. Scott came out to Bristol and helped me make this and design this temporary Dodger. We used some sheets of uh, half and quarter inch marine grade plywood and some small deck screws. It was basically meant to do it as efficiently and as inexpensively as we could. We could have spent less money and not gone with marine grade plywood, but then we would have had to paint it, um, which was a lot more time and effort than the cost difference of buying the marine grade, which you can see is holding up pretty well, all things considered. So the Dodger does a couple things. One, it holds the solar panels. Uh, otherwise, we really don't have a good place to put them. Two, it throws some shade. So without the Dodger, I would be sitting in the blazing sun right now. And between the sail and the Dodger, there's pretty much always somewhere in the cockpit area where you can sit and get out of the sun, which is nice. Uh, and eventually, we'll have clear plastic type material that comes down here after the traveler and gets fitted around the companionway. And then same thing on the sides here. And we can close those in. And when that's done, we'll be able to leave the companionway open even if it's pretty nasty out, which will be really nice. Uh, having the Dodger already makes a big difference. If it's really pouring out, you can you know, open the hatch to about there and get some water coming in, but most of it stays at bay. Uh, and that's been really great. If you look at most of the boats around that are really actively being used, and if you look at pretty much all the liverboards, they have some sort of Bimini Dodger set up so that you can keep the companionway door open uh, and you got a place to put some panels and some shade. Now, Evan from MS Fabrication in Dorchester, who's 
been our go-to metal bender and stainless steel guy, is going to do a frame for us for this. So eventually, these corners will just be a piece of stainless steel tubing that comes up. And Evan's going to make a frame that's the four uprights and some bracing between them. And then I'll use Total Boat's uh, foam core and a little bit of fiberglass and epoxy. And the lid on the top will just be a thin piece of foam core and some fiberglass because it really only needs to be strong enough to stand up to the wind and to hold the solar panels. We're not going to be standing up there or anything. Uh, it'll behoove us to keep that light. We also are going to make it a bit narrower. Right now it's a little wider than it has to be. And we will pattern in a little bit closer to the mast here so that this is just a little bit more closed in. Um, but all in all, it'll stay more or less the, the same size and shape it is now. It'll just be a lot stronger and look way nicer. So on the, on the long, long, long to-do list, for the main here, this is the main sheet traveler. And this needs to be adjusted a bit. So right now it works fine because we don't have a screen in here. But how this works is you can undo those. And you can sheet the boom over and then let this out. So as you can see, we need an opening for these lines to go through or we need to reroute these lines and set this up a little bit different, uh, which is what we're gonna end up doing. We just haven't got around to it yet. So way up forward at the tip of the bowsprit is gonna be the jib, which will be on a roller furler. And we'll be able to control that from all the way back here at the cockpit. So we will be able to furl and unfurl and tack or jibe the jib without going forward. But there's a lot that needs to happen before we can do that. And that's another reason we haven't got the jib on yet. There needs to be a winch base put in right here between these bronze brackets. Um, and that line for the jib will come back and come around that winch. I need to make a little pad to go underneath this bronze bracket that didn't quite meet perfectly. Uh, that's not a big deal. And since we don't have the winch on here and we're not yarding on this cockpit combing, it doesn't go anywhere. Nothing moves. Um, so that floating is of no concern at the moment, um, other than not getting a line cut underneath it or stubbing your toe on it. So I gotta put the winch base in, gotta put a little pad underneath that. And then up forward by the forward end of the house, there's three feet of track that needs to get mounted on deck. So the lines will go from the jib to that track and then run along the house sides, come through a fair lead somewhere in here, and then up to the winch. And yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot of work to do. <laughs> the blocks for the winch bases are already made. Um, but getting those finished and installed is definitely a few days of work. Getting the jib on is another day or two of work. Getting the tracks, their locations figured out and those all mounted is several hours worth of work. Uh, so we've been focusing on things that are affecting us more in the immediate and knowing that at some point here we gotta hunker down and tackle the jib, but I'm just trying to tick off a bunch of smaller projects before we jump into those bigger ones. So down below here we can start in the stem because you know, I guess that kind of makes sense. We have to have some place to start. The only thing that really isn't working is the location of this fan. So we took our best guess at to where they would be and Robin sleeps here and she bumps it a lot with her knees. So I think I need to move that probably up here, uh, so that's a little more out of the way. And then other than that, this is just a pile of stuff. I gotta finish building out storage space here uh, and put in a couple 12 volt plugs so that we can charge phones and that kind of thing. We don't have any charging ports up here in the Four Peak yet. Location of this fan's been great. Location of the light switch here, that's been great. Uh, and then we've got reading lights right above our heads that are red and white. That's worked out great. Uh, and the hatch, love, love, 
love having this hatch above our bunk. I can just sit up and look out, see what direction we're in, make sure everything's fine. And we sleep with this open. Akiva comes and visits. And then when it starts to rain, I wake up with the rain falling on my face and I stand up and I open, close the hatch. And then when I wake up and it's no longer raining, I open the hatch. And uh, even when we have to have the hatch closed, it's clear. So we can still, we can watch the thunder and lightning. We can see the stars uh, when it's too cold out. So in the aft end of our bunk here, we've got the little three gallon diesel tank for the diesel heater. This needs to get mounted up here uh, and get punched through the deck so that we can fill that up. But that doesn't need to get done until it's cold and it is still several months until it is cold. And at some point, I'll build a locker space across the foot of the bunk here um, so that things aren't just tucked in. But for now, that's working fine. And I wish I had brought this over just a couple more inches and got it closer to the mast. Um, but I was really nervous about building this bunk and then putting the mast in and for some reason having it not fit or be too close or whatever. Um, but those, those few extra inches, uh, they don't make a difference coming and going, but they would make a difference sleeping in the bunk. So if I ever redo this mattress, I might leave the frame underneath the same. Just put a little lip out here, just bump this over a little bit, gain a couple more inches, but it's pretty, uh, pretty minor inconvenience, not a big deal. And then the hanging locker's been working out really well. Still have to put the latches and stuff on there. When we're underway, these swing open and bang around if we don't put a zip tie on them. Um, but putting the latches on there, that all needs to be done. Same thing. We've got doors for the locker space underneath here where Robin's got her clothes. It's just a plywood shelf that needs to be cleaned up and painted and put the doors in. Lots, lots of little details. The workbench is working out really well uh, as a large storage area. So because we have so many projects that we're wrapping up, um, this is my rigging bag, got some rags. This bin is all just wires and electrical connections, the USBs to install up forward, um, the cables and connections for the uh, AIS and for the satellite weather and the radar dome. So that's what all that is. This is all the camera gear because I weren't sure if you know, but we run a YouTube channel, so we need to make sure we've got all that. Uh, this is all painting stuff, paperwork, climbing gear to go up the mast, my fishing bag, which we haven't had much time to do, but I hope to do a bit more. Um, we haven't got the running lights wired in yet, so I have some battery operated ones that we can throw up if we have to run at night, which we haven't done yet, and we're trying to avoid uh, until we have those in, but we've got those on standby if we need, uh, and then my tools in the corner. So the workbench has worked super great for storage. Uh, this cargo net has been pretty handy. And I just take it down and clamp it in the vise course and I put a few hooks in so this catches light things like the rigging bag or if you want to stuff a jacket or something back there underway and then the hold downs here with these couple oak boards keep all of the bins nice and tight back there so that even if the boat's on a really massive heel none of that stuff's coming and sliding out uh, so far this has kept everything in place really well and the vice has been handy, and knock on wood, no one has collided with it yet. Uh, and we've been underway, and we've been rocking and rolling, and there's just plenty of space to get past it. So if you were to sneak aboard Arabella at like 5, 5.30 in the morning, you would find Robin in one of three places. She would be A, sitting here at the saloon table working. She would B, be standing next to the stove making her pot of coffee or C, she would be in the cockpit working. Uh, the saloon and the cockpit, just weather dependent. But Robin is the uh, founder, owner, and CEO of Birdhouse Marketing. So she's been, she started that company years ago, 
and they do all sorts of social media, uh, website design, brands, logos, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so she's really lucky in that she can work remote. Uh, so she sits down for numerous hours every morning and tends to her job while I sleep for a little bit and then wake up and tend to mine. So if you ever see Robin busy working on the computer, she's not actually working on A to A stuff. She really doesn't do all of that much to help us out. She is super busy running her own business. The saloon table has worked out really well. So we have the charging ports uh, on the fore and aft ends and port and starboard. And the cubby here has been great. I've been super happy with how this has uh, ended up playing out with the storage here underneath and the USBs. And Robin can be sitting at the saloon table on her computer with the second monitor. And I can be there with my computer and the phone and they can all be plugged in and charging. And we're all right here, uh, which has worked out really well so far. So I got storage behind the set T and this is exactly where it was in Victoria and is doing exactly what it did in Victoria. So we got our main coast cruising guide, boat mechanical and electrical systems book, uh, and Brian tosses the complete riggers. At this point, we don't need any like Bud or Larry because um, we're not actually building the boat so much anymore, but having the systems books is a good reference. This was a purchase right shortly after we moved aboard and I have been over the moon happy with this little Makita vacuum. So it runs on our 18 volt batteries, which we have for the other tools anyways. And it opens up and that's your bag. So, you know, you're not gonna use it as a dust collector, but cleaning up in the boat, it works really well. That bag's reusable. It's got a little hose on it comes with a couple attachments. They uh, kind of designed it towards detailing cars. So you get a bunch of nozzles that you would expect to, to use in car detail. And one of the cool things is on the back here, it has a shroud that clips on the exhaust and it turns the vacuum into a blower. Um, so if we needed to blow up an air mattress or something like that, that'd be real handy. Um, but it's also great for just cleaning out nooks and crannies, blowing some compressed air in there and then following back with the vacuum. So this bad Larry gets used pretty much every day in our futile attempt to keep up with Akiva's dog hair. Yeah, as it floats through the air. <laughs> yeah. The Dickinson gimbal stove has been working out really well. Uh, I need to clean it. I've had a lot going on lately. I have not been on top of getting the galley as clean as we should. Uh, but it's been working great. We've baked in the oven, we've used the broiler, we've used the burners. Um, so far I've been really, really happy with it. There's a latch that needs to be installed to keep it from gimbling when you're sitting at a mooring or something like this. So I gotta get that installed. And you'll notice that the propane line here isn't fully finally run yet. Uh, I need to take care of that very, very, very soon. So far, I'm really pleased with my almost obsessive use of the Cambro bins. So when I was building this space out, you know, it was really deep back there. And I was trying to figure out how to store things back there and have it not just be a cave that needs stuff. And these Cambro bins fit really, really well. I got super lucky with that. So there's a layer of small ones across the bottom that have dried goods and extras, things we don't need very often. And then we've got the big bins across the top that are easy to get to. So Akiva's dog food, our bread, chips and snacks, more snacks. And then the stuff that we get to all the time is in the little ones at the top. You know, granola bars, uh, pancake mix, breakfast, that kind of stuff. Nuts, dried fruit, Robin's all important coffee. And that's been working really well for keeping everything organized and, and neat and tidy back there. And all in all, the, the galley has been working out really well as well. One fun surprise with the grab rails is we, we cut this curve so that it made a really nice handle here. 
made them a little more lower profile and took out some weight and material. But it turns out Robin and I are like just about the perfect height that when we sit on the fridge, we just kind of nestle your shoulder into there and it fits really, really well. When we were at Mystic, one of the judges for the um, competition of all the boats, I was sitting here and he asked if we had set this height and this angle on purpose. <laughs> and I said, no, uh, I kind of wanted to lie and say yes, but this, uh, we got lucky on that one. And that was kind of a fun surprise. The sink's working out well, and this is just from your normal hardware store. So far that's holding up. And we installed foot pumps for salt water and fresh water. And we actually haven't been using the one for the fresh water. It should be there, it needs to be there because if we lose electricity or something happens to the pressure pump, we need to be able to get fresh water out of the tanks. So, um, you know, that is a necessity. But with the lithium iron battery bank and just two solar panels, we've been keeping up with the batteries no problem. And if we run the water maker a bunch or we have a couple cloudy days, we lay out the two or three portable panels and we have a 800 and something amp hour battery bank. And with all of the panels on a bright sunny day, we can go from 60% battery to 90% battery in one day. Uh, so the electricity has been really, really awesome. I've been so happy with that. We haven't really had to worry about it at all. We can turn lights on, we can turn fans on, we can charge things, we can make water, uh, and the battery has kept up with that, no problem. Which is why we've just left the fresh water pump on for the water. So if you turn it on, you have fresh water just like you would at your house, same pressure and everything. Uh, which is nice. And I was unsure whether or not we would have enough power that we could waste the water and waste the electricity with having the pump because you definitely go through a lot more water when you have it pressurized. Uh, but the water maker is fairly efficient and our power generation and storage is working out so well so far that it hasn't been an issue at all to run the water maker for half an hour or an hour a day and keep the tanks topped up. and run water. So there's a lot to think about and worry about and consider and plan for and not having to worry about the energy use and consumption very much has, has been really, really nice. I put some hooks under the edge of the nav table here. So at the base of the companion way, we have our inflatable PFDs and harnesses. So there's four of these down here and then there's another one or two in the lazarette. And then there's the orange ones way up forward. So I think we have enough PFTs for like eight or 10 people and we never have that many on the boat. The nav corner, I mean, honestly, kind of like everything else has been working out pretty well. This is just sitting and floating at the moment. I have to get that attached. And the tiny little screws that we used for these drawers did not hold. So the bottom and the top ended up getting ripped out. So I have to get some little bit longer screws and put those in there. The little one is our only survivor at the moment. And the fridge is fully stocked. And we just went and did groceries because Robin and Jack and I are leaving tomorrow and heading up to Maine. And I don't know if you know Jack, but Jack can eat a lot. So to make sure we're well stocked for this week. Lumberjacks. And this side is the freezer. So we've got a couple bags of ice that are just taking up extra space. Freezers are a lot happier if they're pretty full and you're not just trying to keep a bunch of air frozen. But the freezer has been working out great. It's got the freezer plate on either side. Uh, and my wish and desire and hope and dream in the freezer was that I'd be able to keep ice cream cold enough to stay solid. And I'm very, very happy to report that the sea frost is able to do that. And there are several pints of ice cream buried down in the bottom against the freezer plate, which is where they need to be to stay frozen enough, which is fine. I have no problem 
digging to the bottom corner as long as I know that there's ice cream down there. And someday, when we are crossing an ocean and it is hot and miserable and we are on the verge of mutiny, I'm gonna come out with a few pints of ice cream and it's gonna make that day infinitely better. Stay tuned, because that day will come, I promise you. Um, but it's always, always good to have some ice cream in stores. So thank you, Seafrost. Um, been really, really happy with the system. And uh, yeah, couldn't ask for more having almost as much fridge and freezer space as we have living on land. So this is where Robin can often be found working on her stuff for birdhouse marketing. <laughs> yeah, this is my well-organized desk. When did you start birdhouse? What year was that? 2012. 2012. And how many employees do you have now? Uh, five full-time and two part-time all over the world. I have I have an employee in Spain. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> last time Ben and I were below filming, we went from stem to stern. And one thing that we realized is that we just totally skipped over the head because the door was closed and we didn't really think about it. But there's the composting toilet in there. There's the water maker in there. And there is the single biggest disappointment so far with the systems in the boat also in there. So let's go check out that travesty. So in the head, there is a long, long list of things that need to be done in here. Let me turn on the light. You can see we have all sorts of stuff sitting in the sink right now, and that is because there is no water going to the sink, and there is no drain coming out of the sink. So right now, this is just a really fancy stuff holder. So I got to put the drain in for that, and the exhaust for the airhead here is also not finalized. When I got the airhead, it came with an exhaust fan that went in a housing that would basically bolt against a hole in the bulkhead and the fan is friction fit right in there. And it says right on the fan not to get it wet and not to put it in a damp location. So I didn't really feel confident mounting that even with a cowl vent or something on it because um, there was no way that water on the side deck wasn't gonna make its way in there. So I picked up a different 12 volt fan that's made to go more inline. And that then has the PVC and ABS plastic elbow here. And right now I have the hose stuffed out the porthole. And as you can see, I haven't got a chance to wire it up yet. So this is working on wind blowing past the exhaust and just kind of like helping to suck some of the smell and the moisture out of the toilet. And then we've got a fan blowing through the porthole here. And that's just constantly pushing air into the head and out the porthole. Um, so that when folks use the bathroom, the smell doesn't permeate the entirety of the boat. Uh, and I've got a piece of plastic pipe here, a PVC, and this is gonna replace this hose that came with the airhead simply because this is a shower in here and cleaning all of these little baffles is going to be a nightmare where if we just put in a nice smooth run of pvc that will be much cleaner and much easier to keep clean so that is something that that needs to be finished uh, like I said, there's going to be a shower in here, so that shower head still needs to be installed. The cold and hot water needs to be run for that. And the shower pan that we made many moons ago with the crew at Total Boat, that needs to get sealed into the walls of the head. Uh, and it also needs to have its drain attached, because right now that just drains right to the bilge. So the head works. You can go to the bathroom. That's about all you can really do in here at the moment. Uh, and the real big disappointment with the system so far has been the LED strip lights. So we tried numerous different brands and ones that are made to be outdoors and are supposedly waterproof. We got different connectors for them. But ultimately, 
this is what keeps happening is the LEDs just turn brown and slowly die. Uh, and I don't know why that is. Uh, neither Aiden or I were able to figure out what's going on with that. So it is unfortunate. We put a good amount of them in the boat. They were pretty time consuming and finicky to install. Um, Aiden spent a good amount of time on it and we spent a good amount of money paying Aiden to spend time on it. So that's kind of a bummer that those aren't working out. But if we're two months in and my biggest gripe is that I still have a very long to-do list and the LED lights, strip lights aren't working great, I mean, we're doing all right. I can't really complain. And it's a boat. There will always be a long to-do list. Um, there's just right now, there's still a lot of finishing things. And it's going to be, my guess is another six months to a year before all of those finished building things are done and we switch a bit more into a maintenance and fixing mode. I'll always be tinkering and there will always be stuff to do. Um, but it'll be really nice when, you know, the head's fully functional and the vent's running and we can close this porthole when it rains and not have it get real stinky in here because the vent's still working and, and things like that. And then we've got kind of Robin and I's calendar. So we're headed up here soon for Portland and we've got a mooring the 17th to the 24th in Portland, Maine. And then we're gonna bump our way up kind of to Penobscot Bay. And then we're gonna leave the boat and Robin and I are gonna go back to Granby sometime in the end of the month. And we gotta finish getting moved out of the house. We haven't got around to doing that yet. Uh, and close up shop there. So we'll be in Granby for a week or two. Um, Satchel will be gone at a wedding during that time, so that works out pretty well. And then the very end of September, first week of October, somewhere in there, Robin and I, if you can read my chicken scratch, are headed back to the organs. And we are doing part of that for our three-year anniversary on the 7th and Robin's birthday on the 26th. So when Robin and I first met, actually on our first date, I asked her if she wanted to go on a big trip with me, and she said yes. And on our third date, we bought tickets to go to the organs in New Mexico and go climb in the organs and to go to the Enchanted Tower and to go check out White Sands. And as my buddy Tim said, it was gonna be like riding a tandem bicycle. Didn't know where we were gonna go, but we were gonna get there faster. And I think for both of us, it was like, <laughs> All right, let's go see how this goes. This might be a total disaster, but at least we'll get to the disaster and we won't waste our time. Um, but it went well. It went well. And we had a lot of fun. Three years later, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> um, so we really wanted to try to do the Oregon Traverse. We went out to go scope it out, thinking maybe we would try it, got there, and realized that it was gonna take weeks of going in and out in this range to figure out just how to get from A to B and to wrap our heads. There's just spires everywhere and you've got to weave your way in and out and over and around. And, and I didn't know how crazy you were. And I'm like, is he really going to try to go for this? I'm like, this is not safe. We, <laughs> we don't have enough knowledge. And I'm like, this could be a deal breaker. And uh, you were real reasonable about it. Yeah. So, so we backed down and we said someday Someday we're going to come back for this. Uh, and now that the boat's launched and there isn't this big time crunch to, to get to launch, these are some of the things that we've been really looking forward to doing. So we're going to leave the boat up in Maine, and I think Anne and Aaron, who helped with the planking maybe, and we'll find some other folks to go live aboard her for the month while we're gone and run the water maker and make sure the batteries are good and take care of Arabella. And we're going to head to... New Mexico with a Kiva and go rent a house down there for a month and go throw ourselves at the organs and get annihilated by some mountain ranges and some cacti. <laughs> Definitely going to be some cacti. Yeah, you ready to pull thorns out of you again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I pulled thorns out of myself for three months after we went last time. Yeah, they just kept you'd, working out. You'd get like a little, you know, ingrown hair it would look like and you'd be like, oh, huh. And then a thorn would come out and you're like, no, that's nice. <laughs> And she wants to go back. You wonder why I keep her around. So that's the, uh, that's the plan for the next little bit. When we get back from the organs in very early November, we'll go back to the boat up in Maine and we're gonna keep her in the water. So if the weather's good in November, we'll 
sail and explore and hang out. And if it turns snowy and icy and cold, we'll tie her up to a dock and we're going to go skiing and ice climbing and finish the head and all the other myriad of projects to do on the boat. Yeah. And then next spring is when we'll really take off and, and really start traveling. We'll have been shaken down, the boat will have been shaken down, we'll have finished up a lot of those final projects and really be ready to, to start cruising. And our guest book. So this, we started very early in the build. So 20th of November, 2017. And this was at the visitor entrance at the boathouse. So all of that, maybe a little more, is from people who stopped by the boathouse. And then from about here on is when we went to Matapoiset. And then a whole bunch from launch and the boat show and the recent meet and greet that we did here in Newburyport. I'm really, really, really glad that we got this at the beginning of the build and people have had a chance to sign it and some people have signed it on every visit. And uh, yeah, I've sat down and flipped through it on more than one occasion. And this is definitely something that I'll treasure for a very, very, very long time.